trial of the Chicago 7s about a group of anti-Vietnam War protesters charged with attempting to incite violence at the 1968 Democratic National Convention. What attracted you in 2019, 2020 to tell that story in 1968? What did you feel it had to offer to a contemporary audience? It was actually uh, now 17 years ago um, uh, that on a Sunday morning, uh, I was asked to come over to Steven Spielberg's house. Just to be clear, that's uncommon. Um, <laughs> I don't hang out with Spielberg on Sundays at, at his house. Uh, and uh, I came in and um, uh, he told me he, that he wanted to make a movie about the Chicago 7 and he wanted me to write it. Uh, and I said, the Chicago 7, that is a great idea. I would love to write a movie about the Chicago 7. And then I left his house and called my father and asked him who the Chicago 7 were. <laughs> I'd never heard of them. I was just saying yes to doing a movie with Spielberg the way literally anybody would. Um, uh, and then it just, it, f for a lot of reasons, it just kind of kept not getting made. Uh, and, uh, and the years went by, and, and I kept writing it. Um, uh, I will, for me, the shark gets as big as the tank. I, my scripts, whether it's an episode of television or a play or a screenplay, a movie, um, uh, they're not finished, they're confiscated. Uh, somebody, somebody says, pencils down, you, we have to, <laughs> you're done, okay? We have to roll a camera on this. Um, so I kept writing it, uh, and uh, then I directed, uh, for the first time, I, I directed Molly's Game. And uh, Stephen saw Molly's Game and said, you know what, you should direct Chicago 7, and the time to make it is, is now, um, uh, because, uh, Donald Trump was running for president and had been elected president and I mean, didn't want to get back to Trump, but this is why the movie got made. Uh, he was having rallies and there would be uh, some protesters at the rally and he would wax nostalgic about the old days when we used to carry that guy out of here on a stretcher and somebody punch him in the face and somebody should beat the shit out of that guy. And he was talking about the Chicago 7. Um, so it seemed like there was now uh, a reason to make the movie. Did Spielberg mentor you through that? Yeah, it's scary. Um, uh, he, he, he would kind of want to be hands off, um, and then he would tell me something that I would not understand. Um, uh, like, you know what I'd do is I'd desaturate that, and I, I'd hit it with a 70, and I'd just be praying that there was someone else in the room who was writing this down and could tell me what he said, because the last thing I wanted to do was not do what he told me to do. Um, uh, so yes, he was, he was very helpful, very, very supportive. When you're writing a, a film like The Social Network that involves actual real people that, that you may then actually have to meet, what obligation, if any, do you feel to them? Okay, great question, and, and it comes up a lot. When you're writing nonfiction, um, how, how non is it? <laughs> it's the difference between a photograph and a painting. Um, and what I do, if, forgive me if it sounds pretentious, is a painting uh, and not a photograph. It's not journalism, it's art. And there's a difference also between truth and accuracy. Again, accuracy is what journalism goes for. And I'll give you an example uh, from the social network. Uh, I, I had um, in my possession the live blog that Mark Zuckerberg did. Um, it was in 2003, fall semester uh, at Harvard on the night that he created this terrible hot or not website called FaceMash, right? He, he was live blogging while he was hacking into the different student directories, which were called Facebooks uh, at Harvard, at the different dorms or houses uh, at their call, as they're called at Harvard, collecting photographs of the women uh, uh, undergraduates and creating this website that became so popular in a matter of a few hours that it crashed the computer system uh, at Harvard. 
And we know from his live blog that he was drinking and drunk uh, while he was doing this, okay? So what I did, uh, and he was very unhappy about the date he had just been on. And I, I changed the girl's name, but other than that, uh, I left it the way it was. So I imagined the bad date uh, and wrote that. And the second scene uh, is we hear in voiceover him live blogging. And what I called for in the script was we're on his computer screen uh, in his dorm room. As he walks into the frame, powers up the computer, walks out of the frame, comes back in with a glass, puts it down, puts ice in the glass, put vo puts vodka in the glass, orange juice in the glass, and begins typing. All the while we're hearing in voiceover uh, him live blogging this. About two weeks before shooting started, we found out that he was actually drinking beer that night. Bex, to be exact. And David Fincher said, Aaron, you're going to have to change it to Bex. And I pleaded with him not to. Not just because making a screwdriver, making a, a vodka and orange juice is more visually interesting than opening a bottle of beer. But because opening a bottle of beer doesn't read necessarily as drinking to get drunk. It can just read as a college kid is thirsty on a Tuesday night. Right. Um, uh, and the more important truth, the beer was accurate. The vodka and orange was the truth. He was Drinking to get drunk. Um, uh, and I've lost that argument, by the way. It's beer in the movie. <laughs> yeah. But that, it's just an example of, um, of the difference between truth and accuracy. Um, so you, many fans of the West Wing, one of the things they like is the snappy dialogue. And I think you've kind of explained... So to get that rhythm, you're actually reading aloud yourself and you're playing both characters as you're writing. Is mm -hmm. that how you're working it out? Yeah. Um, yes. Uh, and uh, my parents started taking me to see plays from when I was very young. Uh, and oftentimes, I was too young to understand what was going on. Like, Who's afraid of Virginia Woolf when I was seven? Yeah, you know, uh, <laughs> things that really like child protective services should have shown up. <laughs> but I loved the sound of dialogue. Um, it, it sounded like music to me. These great actors, just words crashing into each other. Um, and, uh, and I wanted to imitate that sound. Uh, so what a line of dialogue sounds like is as important to me as what it means. Um, and, uh, and the actors know that. And the actors, after a take, will go to the script supervisor and say, I, I dropped a syllable uh, in there somewhere. Um, I, and they, they will have. They'll understand that just like in music where you're, if you're in 4-4 four, four time, there have to be four beats in a measure. There can't be three. There can't be five. That it, it, This works the same way. I, I wanted to ask you actually about the use of um, music in your work. Obviously, um, the theme for The West Wing and the way it's, that music's used throughout an episode is, is very rousing. It sounds like there's about 157 horns in the theme. It is horns all the way down. The Social Network, very different kind of music um, composed by Atticus Trent Ross Reznor and Trent Reznor yeah. from Nine Inch Nails. Um, amazing uh, use of music in that film. They won an Academy Award for it. When you're scripting and you're using language, are you ever thinking... Okay, I can I can be sparse here because the music is going to do some of the emotional heavy lifting for me. I that's a very nice way of putting it. <laughs> the reality is, I will go to the composer and say, "I need you to save me here." <laughs> uh, <laughs> I just I couldn't make it happen. I want people to cry. <laughs> Help me out. Um, oftentimes, especially with West Wing episodes, um, uh, because on the West Wing, again, it didn't work the way it does on other television shows. On other television shows are run very professionally. Um, uh, they, you know, the, the, the showrunner and the writing staff, they get together at the beginning of the season. They sort of uh, sketch out uh, 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 an arc for the whole season. So if we want to be here by the end of the season, we need to be here by Christmas, so we need to be here by Halloween and uh, uh, that kind of thing. And they start assigning episodes to different people. 
uh, I, I write all the episodes myself. I get a lot of help from a writing staff that pitches me ideas and, uh, and does research, but uh, I write the show. Um, and when I am done with one episode, I do not have a clue what the next episode uh, is going to be. I'm, I'm out, and I'm, I, I get to be happy for five minutes that I finished, but then I realize that all that means is I haven't started the, the next one yet. And one of the ways that I would kind of try to get something going is I drive around in my car and listen to music. Usually the music I listened to when I was in high school, uh, for some reason, it would do it for me. And um, if I would get really lucky, I'd hear a song that I'd suddenly want to use as score for a scene. I'd want to write the scene that that song uh, is used for. For instance, um, there's another um, uh, kind of well-known episode uh, of the show, Two Cathedrals. Um, <laughs> thanks a lot. Two Cathedrals began with the Dire Straits song, um, uh, Brothers in Arms. Uh, I, I just heard it, and I hadn't heard the song in a long time, and it got me so emotional, like thinking about you know, the West Wing gang uh, and this song and everything that Bartlett uh, was going through that I just worked backwards. Um, uh, and I knew this is gonna be uh, uh, the end of the episode, and I'll work back from there. Mm -hmm.